Happy Easter, Redeemer Church family. I hope that you are doing well on this Resurrection Sunday. I'd also like to say welcome and happy Easter to anyone who may be joining us for the first time. We are thrilled that you're worshiping with us on this Easter Sunday. As we worship our risen Lord today, we'll be following along with a bulletin. You can find this copy of the bulletin on our website, redeemerprez.church. Click on the button that says Online Worship and Bulletin. And then underneath the video of this service, you'll find the link to follow along with this service. The song lyrics will be printed on your screen. However, the other parts of the service will be found in the bulletin. Now take a few minutes and prepare your hearts to worship our risen King. Okay, church, let's call each other to worship. You will see it is responsive. I will read all the parts. Join with me where you see people and all. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us worship our risen King. Pray with me now. Father in heaven, we praise your name and we come before you now as your people who you have called to yourself. And Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you, our risen Lord, and we praise you that you went to the cross in our behalf such that we stand before you right now as holy and righteous and accepted and you rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. Praise your name. And now, Holy Spirit, empower us now. Stir our hearts to worship you. And you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God, we worship you now. Amen. O church and lift your voices Christ has conquered death and hell Sing as all the earth rejoices Resurrection anthem swell Come and worship, come and worship Worship Christ the risen King See the tomb where death has laid Worship Christ the risen King Hear the earth protest and tremble See the stone removed with power All hell's minions may assemble But cannot withstand his hour He has conquered, he has conquered Christ the Lord the risen King Doubt may lift his head to murmur, scoffers mock and sinners cheer. But the truth proclaim a wonder, thoughtful hearts received with cheer. He is risen, he is risen, now receive the risen King. We acclaim your life, O oh Jesus, now we Sing your victory. Sin or hell may seek to seize us, but your conquest keeps us free. Stand in triumph, stand in triumph. Worship Christ the risen King. Stand in triumph, stand in triumph. Worship Christ the risen King. The Lord is 
is risen today. Ah, hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Ah, hallelujah. Praise your joys and triumphs high. Affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed, and it's fitting on this Easter Sunday to join with believers from all different backgrounds and from different nations all across the world worshiping today, as well as those all throughout church history who we stand on our shoulders and believe the, the, this common faith is called the Apostles' Creed, not because it was written by the Apostles, but because it summarizes what the Apostles' Taught. Join with me now as we confess together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as we approach the time where we go before our God in prayer. We approach him as our father, and we approach him as our father because the Lord Jesus Christ atoned for our sins, the perfect sacrifice on the cross, and he rose from the dead. And because of his work, we can approach God as our father. So let's do so now. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. All honor and glory and praise belongs to you, for you are holy and righteous and just and good, merciful and gracious, and we praise you today. And Father, we know that you are eager to hear our prayer, and as you hear our prayers, you you respond, you answer, you move. And so in faith, we offer our prayers before you and we cry out, we need you. We're desperate for you. And we continue to stand in need 
before you, Father. I pray for our people now. I pray that you would knit our hearts together. As we're scattered all throughout the city in our homes, would you still knit our hearts together in unity? Bind us together, Father, as your church. I pray that you would continue to cause trust to rise in our hearts, that we would look to you for everything we need. And Father, I pray as fatigue may be setting in through social distancing, that you would grant us patience and endurance. I pray, Father, for those who are um, especially on the front lines of this virus, Father, whether that be in the medical field, the financial field, whatever business that may look like, I pray that you would give them great skill in their vocation as they educate children from a distance or students from a distance. Wherever our people may find themselves, give them what they need, Father. I pray for those who are lonely, comfort them. Remind them not only that you are with them, but that they have a church family around them. I pray for those who may be disappointed, I pray that they would find their joy in you, Father. We don't just pray for us as a church, but we pray for, we pray broadly for our state, our nation, and our world. We continue to bring these petitions before you, asking that you would bring healing to the sick and the suffering, that you would comfort the grieving. Oh, I pray that your resurrection, Lord Jesus Christ, would be great Hope that those who are grieving may grieve, but grieve as those with hope. We pray for medical workers. We pray for our local, our national, our global leaders. Grant them wisdom and skill in their leadership and compassion. Help them to make sound decisions with the information before them. And Father, We pray for the church throughout the world right now. We pray for our brothers and sisters in other nations that may not be able to gather freely and worship you. Strengthen them in the face of persecution. Strengthen your church throughout the world. Grant us creativity and and a winsome witness to bear witness that you, Lord Jesus, have risen from the dead. That is what our world needs today, and I pray that you would empower us through your spirit to declare that news, this good news to the world. We love you, and we pray all this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we reach the final installment 
of our study in the Gospel of Mark, which we began in August. And we're going to conclude the study by looking at Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. So if you have your Bible uh, in your copy of God's Word, turn to chapter 16, verses 1 through 8 at this time. And last week we looked at the cross. We looked at Jesus' death on the cross and we saw that Jesus is our crucified Messiah, the Son of God who died in our place. And because of his death, our sins, not in part but in whole, are atoned for. And today, Luke, I'm sorry, not Luke, Mark takes our attention onto the empty tomb. And we're going to see that not only is Jesus our crucified Savior, but he's also our risen Lord. We're in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Let me pause there and say this. We have three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. And it's very interesting. Mark's about to tell us the account of the empty tomb. And who are the witnesses to the empty tomb? Three women. And Mark is very intentional here to show us that these women have also witnessed two other events in Jesus' life. In verse 40 of chapter 15, Mark notes, it's like he draws our attention. They saw Jesus die on the cross. And then in Verse 44, I'm sorry, verse 47 of chapter 15, he, Mark notes that they saw where he was laid. They saw Jesus placed in the tomb and the stone rolled in front of it. They saw Jesus die and they saw him buried in the tomb and now they're about to be witnesses to the empty tomb. And while we're not going to spend our time this morning on discussing the historical truth of the resurrection, I want to pause and say that is important and the evidence is important. And look what this points to. In Jewish culture, a woman wasn't a credible witness. And yet, if you were going to make up a story, you would not have women as your witnesses, but in God's providence, it's three women who are the witnesses to the empty tomb. And not only these women, but we know from Paul's account later on in the scriptures that the risen Lord appeared to Hundreds. We have eyewitnesses of the account of the resurrection. Let me, let me pick back up in verse 2. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They weren't expecting it. When they went to the tomb, they were expecting to anoint Jesus' body in burial. They were not expecting an empty tomb. Verse 4. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. In entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. We know that this is an angel sent by God. Verse 6. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. If you're looking in your Bible, you might see a footnote or a note that says some of the earliest manuscripts do not include the verses that follow after verse 8. We will address that a bit later in the sermon. But for now, let's pray and ask God to bless the study of his word. Father in heaven, as we study your word now and as we look at the account of your son, risen from the dead. We ask that you send the Spirit opening up our eyes to see 
the Lord Jesus Christ in all of His glory. Guide my words in this time. Guide our hearts as we hear Your Word. Would we respond in faith? And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So my children came home a few days ago and they told me a a great line they heard on the radio. I didn't hear it myself. They reported it to me and it's fantastic. And it says this, that our church buildings may be empty today, but so is the tomb. I like that. Today's our day where we celebrate an empty tomb. We talk about the empty tomb. And, and, And we stand today, all of our faith, Hope and trust is built on this truth that the Lord Jesus Christ bodily, physically rose from the dead. Like I said earlier while we were reading this passage, my intent this morning is not to put forward an argument or a case for why the resurrection is true. That's important. Evidence is important. In fact, Scripture is careful to show us the evidence regarding Jesus' resurrection. But as we look at the empty tomb, and as Mark takes the camera lens, and he focuses it on this tomb that is now empty, the question I want us to ask, and it's a question I've asked a large portion of my life and continue to think through, is this. What does the empty tomb mean? The The tomb is empty. What does that mean for you and for me? So that's the question I want to put before us. And as we look at this question, what, what's the meaning of the empty tomb? We'll see that our text is going to show us that it means this. It means peace with God. Hope for the future. And discipleship in the present. We'll unpack those as we go. But let's begin with the first one. Peace with God. So the women come up to this empty tomb. And they, they see that it's empty, but... For them, what does it mean? So many things could have happened. I mean, you see they're they're shocked. And Mark tells us that they don't just see the empty tomb. The word he uses is observe. That as they approach, they see the stone rolled away. They walk in and, and they see the angel. They're alarmed, our text tells us. What is the meaning of the empty tomb? A tomb empty all by itself can mean many things. But the Lord, in this powerful, significant moment, in history, where God has intervened, gives meaning to the empty tomb. And how does he give meaning to the empty tomb? He sends an angel with a message. He reveals to us the meaning. And the angel says, this is an occasion to be alarmed. You're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. Well, he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then look in verse 7. What does the angel tell the women to do? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, put emphasis on those two words, and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Ever since Peter's failure, when he denied Jesus, we haven't heard Peter's name again in the gospel until right now in this point. Peter, who failed, who denied Jesus. Listen to this message of good news. Go tell the disciples and Peter. And Peter, the one who failed Jesus, that he has risen and that he's gone ahead of you to Galilee. And to make sure we catch this connection, um, we see Mark record, there you will see him just as he told you. Now, where did Jesus tell the disciples that he was going to rise and go to Galilee. Now, we know that three different times throughout Mark's gospel, he predicts his resurrection. We see it in Mark 8. He predicts his suffering and that he'd rise from the dead. We see the same thing in, I'm sorry, not verse 8, chapter 8, chapter 9, and verse 10. But even in those three instances, Jesus doesn't tell the disciples that he's going to go ahead of them to Galilee. Where does he tell them? It's in chapter 14. Verse 28, right in the context of Peter's denial. Right when Jesus says this, he says, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, 
I will go before you to Galilee. And that's where Peter then says, even, even if I have to die, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me. The connection is so clear. This is a message of good news, of peace for all of the disciples, but it's, and certainly Peter. And like we looked at a few weeks back, the risen Christ does appear to Peter. And that relationship is restored. The accounts found in John, we talked about it a few weeks back. So what does the empty tomb mean? The empty tomb means peace with God. What did Jesus, the risen Christ, what did he tell the disciples over and over as he appeared to them? Peace, peace be with you. There is now peace between us and God. Why? Because as we looked at, on the cross, what did Jesus say? It is finished. Atonement has been made. We are completely forgiven and our sins are paid for. And therefore, there's no more atonement left to be made. We are righteous. And his resurrection, the empty tomb, declares that to us. What does Romans 4, 24 say? I want you to listen to this. You don't have to turn there in your Bibles, but let these words sink in. Paul is arguing for how we're counted righteous by our faith in Jesus Christ. And he says this at the very end of this argument in this portion of the book. He says, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses. That's what we looked at last week. Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Justification simply means to be declared righteous. So when we look at the empty tomb, what does it mean? It means that we're righteous and that we've been welcomed by God. That we have peace with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is nothing left, no barrier between us. In John, the book of John 20, 17, the risen Christ appears to Mary Magdalene. And in the course of his conversation with Mary, he says these words. He says, go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Let me paraphrase what Jesus is saying in that moment. What he's saying is this, go to my brothers and let them know that they have been welcomed into the family of God. It's family language. And that's our standing before God. I remember it was a period in college in my life that I was just down and depressed and weighed um, underneath. I was feeling the weight of guilt just for shortcoming in my life. And I couldn't even fathom how God would look on me with any sort of favor, let alone a smile. And I had a meal at a restaurant with a man who I love and who I respect. And I was just kind of pouring out my heart to him, and he just stopped me. He looked at me and he said, Nick, God's smiling on you right now. And those words were like a bucket of cold water. It was almost a shock. Surely he can't be smiling on me. And it's, it's not a superficial smile. It's not a, it's not... It's a costly smile. It's the smile that was won by the Lord Jesus. It's the Father's love who sent the Son to the cross, who died in our place, and who rose from the dead. And because of that, the empty tomb, we have the smile of God, or to put it in the language of the Bible, in Zephaniah, it says this, that God rejoices over us. There was a quote by... J.I. Packer, that on the first sermon in the book of Mark, we discussed this quote. And on this last sermon, I want to bring us back to something that J.I. Packer said. He said this, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. 
if this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Let me go back. If, if this does not control his worship and prayers, how do we approach God and our daily devotions? If we have time with God alone, do we approach him as a child before a father who loves us and welcomes us when we come to worship? I know we can't walk in here and worship uh, and gather together right now, but in our homes, when we approach God and worship, is our, is our identity a child before a father will certainly awe and reverence. He, he alone is God, but he's our God who welcomes us as his children. G.I. Packer says there's a few things that we should always be reminding ourselves over and over and over, and the first is, I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My Savior is my brother, and every Christian is my brother too. The empty tomb is proof that this is true for the believer. He's been raised for our justification. Go tell the disciples, go tell Peter, he's risen from the dead. We've been welcomed by God. If you're seeking, bit skeptical. What does the empty tomb even mean? Well, the first thing it means is that we can be welcomed. All those who place their trust, who look to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that what he declared on the cross, it is finished, is true, and who believe that God raised him from the dead are welcome. That's the good news of Easter. And for Christians, we're reminded that this is the heart of the gospel. What does the empty tomb mean for us? The empty tomb means that God, in his love, has come to dwell with us, and Jesus accomplished that. We are now with God in union with Jesus Christ. So, what does the empty tomb mean? The first thing it means is that we have peace with God. The second thing it means is that we have hope for the future. Look with me in verse 6. Three words in English. It's a one-word sentence in the Greek. He has risen. A one-word sentence with gigantic implications. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says that Jesus' resurrection, it's the first fruits of our resurrection. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and because of those three words, he has risen, the empty tomb means this, we will rise too. And not only will we rise, just as Jesus rose from the dead physically and bodily, so will we, but this entire world will be restored and renewed. Heaven is not just spiritual, but the Bible declares that God will dwell with his people in a physical, glorious world. That is the vision of the Bible. And if you think about the Bible as one story, which it is, it begins in a garden and it ends in a city. And you have these two bookends in the Bible. The first is this picture of life as it should be in the Garden of Eden. And then brokenness comes in. And then you see this other bookend at the end of the Bible, and it's a picture of life restored to the ways it should be. It's not just Eden, it's Eden, but more glorious. And God has now dwelt with his people. In fact, this was the vision of the Old Testament prophets, that there would be a day when God would restore this broken world. And the resurrection is the first event of God's promised resolution to the rebellion of the garden. That was a quote from Michael Williams. 
the resurrection, as we look at the empty tomb, it is the proof, the first evidence that God has remained true to his promise that he will restore all things and that it gives us hope of the future restoration. Now, what does that mean for us? It means this, as we live in between these bookends, we still experience a longing for Eden. There's something about us that remembers life as it was supposed to be, and we long for that. We, God made us to flourish as people. It's good and right, and we, we miss that. We long for it. Yeah, we get taste and glimpses, and we experience things now, but we, it's not our home. It's, yes, there's, there's goodness, yet there's great brokenness, and we long for a time where the sadness and the grief and the pain will be no more. I've been reflecting on how the coronavirus exposes this longing. I mean, just take a few examples. Disappointments we're experiencing. We, we're experiencing some disappointments because of sporting events. Our, my, my boys' Little League season has been postponed. Will we get to place? I don't know. Um, some senior trips have been canceled or postponed. Family vacations have been canceled or postponed. And it just reminds us of the disappointments we experience in this fallen world, that nothing is guaranteed. Or take the loneliness that all of us, to some degree, are experiencing through the social distancing. And how that may remind us of a greater loneliness we feel. That, that is not brought on by the coronavirus, but it just exposes maybe the loneliness that we feel in singleness. Or maybe the loneliness that we experience in a marriage where love has left a long time ago, still married, but it's as if two roommates are living in the same house. And it exposes these longings that we desire for our lives and our relationships. I've also been thinking about the non-essential businesses, how we're not able to go to non-essential businesses and non-essential businesses are not able to really be open at this time. And this is not a statement on whether they should be or should not be. We're in full compliance with our leaders and the direction they're leading us right now. I've just been reflecting on how life is more than the essentials, than food and shelter. Beauty is essential. About a week ago, my family went to Poinsett Bridge. We were dying for a hike. We just needed to get out of the house. We were going stir crazy, and we just needed to be out in God's world, in, in, in nature. We, so my wife was searching for hikes. We knew the state parks were closed. We thought we found one. We went to the trailhead only to find that it was closed. So then we ended up going to Poinsett Bridge. You may be familiar with Poinsett Bridge just up north of us. Um, beautiful spot, old bridge with a creek that runs right through it, some hiking trails around. Hiking trails were closed. Yes, we were disappointed. Uh, but we spent some time in the creek Kids built a dam. It was nice. It was a, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. But still, as I was sitting there, unable to hike, thinking how we were just limited to this little experience, I was thinking how life is more than just, quote, unquote, the essentials. Art and music and eating out with friends are all part of human flourishing. And see, we long for that. We long for the experiences of everyday life without the sadness or the pain. I, as I've been thinking about these non-essential businesses, I, I think about this quote from the Shawshank Redemption. It's a movie that came out in 1994. And I certainly, as I bring up this movie, I'm very aware that it's a hard movie. There are some, I don't commend all of it. I mean, there are some scenes that are hard. There's some language that's hard. It is a, it is a beautiful work of art. And the main character, Andy, he's, Falsely accused, convicted, finds himself in prison. And he gains some responsibility with the warden over time. And so he gets the privilege to be in the administrative office. And there's this moment in the movie where the warden's gone, this guard is in the restroom, and Andy finds himself in this office and he finds a record of Mozart. And you can see the twinkle in his eye and he gets an idea and he takes this record and he places it down on the record player. 
And then he takes the PA speaker that's going to play this music for all of the prisoners in the camp. And Mozart starts playing over the entire prison. And all the prisoners stop. And they just listen. And you can, without any words, you can feel the longing that's being communicated in that movie. And then at just the right time, and in just the only way that Morgan Freeman could narrate this moment, I cannot do justice to this quote, but just picture, instead of my voice, hear Morgan Freeman saying this. I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man in Shawshank felt free. In Red's voice, you hear the longing for life as it should be. And the obvious with the coronavirus is it exposes our fragile health. I mean, how crazy that a virus that jumps from an animal to a human on the other side of the world creates a global pandemic that has us in a time that we've, none of us have ever experienced before, at least on this level. No, I know it's not uh, as worse as it could be, and there's been events in history far worse, nor, nor may it ever be as worse as it could be. But we're reminded of our fragile health and of our ICU capacities. And of course, it reminds us of the very last enemy, which is death. As we're reminded of all these things, and even, even if we won't contract the virus, even if we do not experience death in this moment, we're reminded that that is the final enemy. And there's something in us that cries out and says, no, this is not the way it's supposed to be. We, years of investing in our in a, in a life's work or business should not be up in the balance because of a pandemic. We shouldn't be concerned for our health. We shouldn't be concerned for our, we shouldn't be grieving over the loss of life right now. Now, don't get me wrong. Even in this midst of where we have longing, God is so gracious, and we have so many things to give thanks for. I mean, our lives are full of his hand, bringing moments of beauty. Of course, he's given us so much to be thankful for, and yet there's an and. There's still the sadness. There's still the pain. There's still the grief, and it's a, it creates a longing. And it's not a longing just for a spiritual heaven where we will be spirits forever. That's not the Bible's picture of eternity. Christ's resurrection is physical. It's body. It's bodily. And so will our resurrection be as well. And we'll find ourselves in this world. As Tim Keller says, he says, ordinary life is going to be redeemed. And what is ordinary life but food and work and chairs by the fire and hugs and dancing? and mountains, this world. Guys, I've been reflecting on that. Isn't that what we long for, is this world, our life, to be redeemed? I mean, just think, to be able to eat watermelon on a summer afternoon next to a mountain creek, those are the moments that we say, yes, this is life. We're, we're living or sledding all day in the perfect snow just the right consistency. And then you're exhausted and you go inside and you drink hot chocolate and you belly laugh about how your friends wiped out that day. It's sitting around a table with really good food, prepared with diligence, presented in beauty, and then laughing and storytelling and experiencing love and friendship. It's work, it's dreaming, and then planning, and then 
preparing or building or executing and then sitting back with that feeling of this is a job well done and we have blessed someone else. It's, that, it's those moments we have in life where it seems as if the curse on the ground, the toil has lifted and we're saying, I could do this forever. I sense God's pleasure when I'm doing this. It's a good night's sleep. It's sitting on the beach and listening to the roar of the waves or it's crashing through them and then wading out in the ocean. It's these moments and we long for a time where we, will not, where we can experience those moments without the fear of sadness, without the fear that they will end or without grieving that they have ended for those who we love. That's what the empty tomb means. The empty tomb means that we have a great hope that one day Jesus is going to restore. And just uh, restore this world. And just as he rose from the dead, we will rise too. Have perfect physical bodies. And then this world will be restored, made more glorious. And God will dwell with us. The bookend, at the end, Revelation 21, starting in verse 3, ending in verse 5, says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Tim Keller quotes this story of that. Johnny Erickson Tata shares, and he says he thinks about her every Easter, and he quotes her as saying this, and the quote in context, um, so you know, Johnny Erickson Tata at 17 years old had an accident where she became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. Beautiful woman of faith, and the Lord has used mightily to just tell of his goodness but she, she says this, that early on, it was very hard when she'd be in church and the priest would ask everyone to kneel. And then she was at this large gathering and everyone was asked to kneel, but she couldn't. She started to weep, but she says that she was weeping happy tears because as she looked out and she saw everyone kneel down and praying, she said it was a picture of heaven. And as everyone was kneeled down and praying, her thoughts went to heaven, and she writes this, that she, I was reminded that in heaven, I will be free to jump up, dance, kick, and do aerobics. And, she continues, sometimes before the guests are called to the banquet table at the wedding feast of the Lamb. So she's talking, okay, we're going to have this wedding feast of the Lamb. And sometime before the guests are called in, and we're seated with Jesus, the first thing I plan to do on resurrected legs is to drop on grateful, glorified knees. I will quietly kneel at the feet of Jesus. And then she adds, I, with shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful, and dazzling. She writes this. Can you imagine the hope that the resurrection gives someone who has a spinal cord injury like me? What does the empty tomb mean? Hope. Everything has changed because Jesus rose from the dead. There's one final thing I'd like to say from this text is that what in regards to the question, what does it mean? It means discipleship in the present. We won't spend much time here, but we need to look at how this story ends. So direct your attention with me 
to verse 8. They saw an angel in an empty tomb. Just put yourself there for a second. How would you respond? And now verse 8 shows us how they respond. They, they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They're trembling. What just happened? They're astonished. And our text says they're fearful. Isn't this a very honest picture of our response to the resurrection. There's great wonder and astonishment. Everything has changed, and yet we find ourselves not in the new world yet. We're still here. Christ has risen. He is seated right now with God, at God's right hand, the Father's right hand. He's resurrected. We're not. We still await that day. So this is a time of of wonder. Everything has changed, and yet fear as we still live in a fallen world. What what was part of the reason for their fear? One one person says this, you know, maybe Mark's not so much asking the question um, about why did they not tell the disciples as much as why didn't these, why didn't all of Jerusalem hear about Jesus' resurrection immediately? Because our text says they were fearful. They weren't telling anyone at this moment. But as we look how the story ends, it doesn't end as we would expect, does it? And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, period. That's the end of the gospel of Mark. Why does it end so abruptly? We, we expect something more. Shouldn't Jesus appear to someone? Shouldn't we have a resurrection appearance or the great commission? And some obviously some people throughout a church history thought so. So there's some additional endings to the book of Mark. And, and, and I want to address this real briefly and say this. Verses 9 through 20 of chapter 16. Most agree that those are not original to Mark. First, they don't appear in our earliest manuscripts. Second, some of our early church fathers aren't aware of these verses. And there's some debate out there that says, well, Mark didn't intend to end with verse 8. Maybe he did actually want to have a longer ending. Either he didn't have the chance to write it or we've lost it. But that's, while we can speculate or think about that, what about this? In God's providence, God's word ends in verse 8. And and others think that Mark did intend to end abruptly. And that's actually the camp that I'm in myself, that this is an intentional. And with the abrupt ending, something is being communicated to us. So in God's province, we have an abrupt ending. And what does that communicate to us? D.A. Carson writes this. He says, the confusion and astonishment of the women leaves us wondering what it all means. Isn't that the question we began with? What does the empty tomb mean? And that in just the question Mark, and that is just the question Mark wants us to ask and find answers to. Throughout our study in the book of Mark, we've been asking two questions. Who is Jesus? And our answer to that is he is the crucified Messiah, the Son of God, who did not just die on the cross, but rose from the dead. In his great love for us, he came to bring us to him. Who is Jesus? He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He alone is to be worshiped and praised and followed, which leads us to the second question. Not only who is Jesus, but what does it mean to respond to him? What does it mean to follow him? And is that not the question that's thrust before us? What what does this all mean? They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, how will we respond? I was talking to Michael Guerrero, a member of our church, about this shorter ending. We had a wonderful conversation. It was great to talk with him. And in the course of our conversation, he said this. It's almost like you're asked, well, what happened? You want to find out. It leads us to seek, well, did the women go and tell the disciples? We know they did because of other parts of the Gospels and 
Scripture. We, we know from other parts of the Bible how this story comes out, but it, it leads us to ask what happened and to go and seek and to find out. And that's a perfect place to be if you're skeptical and seeking. As, as this book ends abruptly, it thrusts the question to you. How will you respond to Jesus? Of course, the answer is in faith, to embrace him and receive him, to base your whole life upon him and to receive what he won for you. But if you're not there yet, I encourage you to seek. Look into this. What does the empty tomb mean? And then for us who know Jesus, who are united to him, who are forgiven and holy and blameless, and who celebrate him resurrected from the dead and our whole hope Our entire life is built on this man. Where does that leave us? I find it fitting to end our study in the Gospel of Mark, just like Mark ends his book, abruptly. And I want to end it abruptly with a question that says this. What does it look like to follow the resurrected Lord in a world that is yet to be resurrected. By God's grace, let's work out that question together in the days to come. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you rose from the dead. All of our hope is in you. We bring nothing before you that commends us to you, that earns your favor or your love, you have won it all and you have pursued us. When we were not pursuing you, you came to us, you died in your place and you rose from the dead and we praise you for that. All glory and power and honor is yours. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursing tree his body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance here by heavy stone messiah still and all alone
The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My curse transfixed on Jesus' face. Church, receive the Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.